Good morning. It's, uh, it's good to be with you. Uh, my name's Roy. I bring greetings from the north of England. But I, I came to you to Norfolk this weekend. I kind of turn up about three or four times a year. Uh, I came to you this weekend from Oxford. And uh, in Oxford this week, I was in some, uh, well, as you do in Oxford, you go to coffee shops. And uh, I had two emails last night when I was at the farm, top farm, Marsham, uh, asking me about my customer experience. <laughs> in one word, what would you describe the experience? And one was brilliant. And the other was, in one sentence, how would you describe? Well, the staff were friendly, their coffee was rubbish. <laughs> in one sentence, how would you describe what Jesus came to do? Now, if you look in the Bible, it tells us very clearly, because Jesus was often saying this, he said, the kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of God is here. So what does that mean? It's, it's here now. The good news of the faith is here now. It's not pie in the sky when you die, or as it used to be said, steak on your plate while you wait. Vegetarian options are available. <laughs> Christianity isn't about what happens just after life. It's what happens at the beginning of life, at the emerging of life, in the vulnerability of life. It's life here on earth. Yes, it is life for those who are dying. And in two weeks' time, I will be conducting a service in North Northumberland, and it's called a living funeral. It's for Jane, who is 76 years of age and has got weeks to live. She has terminal esophageal cancer. But when I conducted the funeral of our husband last year, and we had a wonderful Thanksgiving service for a life well lived, and we had a party afterwards, and everybody was just having a great time, Jane said, well, I've got cancer, and when I get near the end, I want my funeral before I die. Because <laughs> I want to be there, just to check out what people say about me. <laughs> but both Bob last year, and Jane now, and a friend of mine who's a prayer supporter of mine, who's dying in Anglesey, they are men and women who know that nothing will separate them from the love of God, not even death itself. Now that's good news for those who are dying, but it's also good news for those of us who are still living. What does the kingdom of God look like? What does it look like? I was privileged to be speaking at the Portuguese service uh, yesterday, and uh, there were three people baptized, giving stories, telling their testimony of how God had transformed and touched their lives. Jesus, in a prayer that I guess many of us whether we're church or not, kind of are familiar with a little bit, the Lord's Prayer. In it, he says, your kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven. Here on earth, right now. So what does that look like? What does that look like? Let me give you an example of what I mean. My wife Shirley and I, on our way to Telford, uh, Telford is definitely not on my bucket list, but anyway, we traveled down through Derbyshire and we had a night away in Bakewell and we stayed at a lovely little hotel and the next morning on the breakfast we were out on the terrace and there was another couple and we got into conversation with them because I'm a Geordie so we just talked to everybody and we got into conversation with this woman who was there with her husband there's a theme to this and she was visiting a college nearby called Cliff College which is a Methodist college she was the first female student of that college a long long time ago and she was visiting because she too had got terminal cancer and she and her husband were visiting those places that were really special to them throughout their lives. And I said, so what did you do after you trained at Cliff? She said, well, I, I was a nurse and I met my husband and uh, he's a doctor and we went out to India and we worked in this little mission hospital 46 years ago. And when she named the hospital, it just kind of, something chimed with me and I, so I looked it up because the name of that hospital rang a bell for me because six years ago I had surgery on my eyes. I had cataracts removed and I had lens implants so I don't wear glasses, for which I thank God. But my surgeon is now at that hospital in, in India, in Kerala. It's one of the largest leading hospitals in the world 
for ophthalmic surgery. It's research, it's phenomenal, it's internationally renowned. But it started with 12 Christians who went out to India to care for those who were struggling with their health. Don't ever minimize the contribution that Christianity has made to the world because it's Christians who've been at the forefront of those things. I read this week in Oxford that 30 years ago, that every single day, 47,000 children in the world died of malnutrition. And today, it's down to 16,000. Look at the UN records and who has been spearheading work to alleviate hunger and malnutrition in parts of the world? Christian agencies, non-government organizations. And Christians throughout the history of the church have provided health care and clinics. They founded the hospitals. The church gets a bad press and sometimes deservedly so. And people will say, church is just full of hypocrites. If anybody says that, I just say, well, you'll, you'll feel at home among us then. Because we're, we're all kind of hypocrites. We're not the best that we would long to be. But that doesn't exclude us from being part of the church of Christ. But the kingdom of God comes through the church when the church fulfills what Jesus calls it to fulfill, to reflect the nature of a God who loves the world. Who were the pioneers of education? Christians. They founded it in their monasteries and in their churches. Robert Rakes, back in the 18th century, he looked at boys who were living in the slums, boys who got into difficulty because they pinched a bit of bread and then they were put into what was known the poor law. It was like a jail. And he said, this is no way to treat people who behave badly. They need to be educated. They need to be seen as a different way of life. And so he started the Sunday school movement. And why was it a Sunday? Because the boys were working six days a week and they were only allowed out on a Sunday. And who were the people who taught those? They were Christians. And they used the Bible because there wasn't a lot of scriptures and readings about. So they used the scriptures. Christianity has made and continues to make a difference in the world. Who was at the forefront of abolishing slavery 230 years ago? A Christian, William Wilberforce. Who founded Amnesty International 52 years ago? A Christian lawyer on the underground in London, reading the paper, was reading about people who were being imprisoned because they were protesting. Don't tell me that these things aren't relevant today. And he founded Amnesty International to fight against those who were imprisoned because of what they believed. The Samaritans, founded by an Anglican priest in 1953. My favorite uh, illustration of what Christians have done is in an organization called Habitat for Humanity. Now, a few years ago now, I was a president. Now, don't get any illusions. I was president of the Baptist Union, so that basically means I, I, was, I was kind of representative figure of the small fish pond. But during my year, we had the centenary celebrations in Birmingham of the international of the Baptists all over the world, of which there are millions. Don't just think that Deerham Baptist Church is some little Baptist church. It's part of seven and a half million Christians throughout the world. But to that centenary congress in Birmingham, President Jimmy Carter came. Remember him? Exquisite. He's actually, he's also dying. This is a theme that's emerging. I'll move on to other things other than death. But Jimmy Carter, with others, founded an organization called Habitat for Humanity. And it's phenomenal. They build homes for the poor. They build homes and make them available to people. And they give people homes who don't even are, are not even required to have a deposit. And they're given homes and they're given the loans with no interest whatsoever. That's good news, isn't it? And they build homes with the poor. And Jimmy Carter has actually been up on the roofs in Belfast and actually been soaring roof timbers as homes were built and communities were connected across the divide between Catholic and Protestant, between Unionist, Loyalist, Republican. That's good news. Please, not anybody tell me that Christianity doesn't make an impact. The kingdom of God is at hand. It's about the good news of Jesus making a difference for the world. There are things on the broad scale but here this morning in Durham, we need to be encouraged and reminded that the place of the church here, as the church here comes to the, towards the end of a series where you've been looking at these things, you are meant to be and called to be good news people. 
we've just celebrated. Give him thanks and pray God's blessing upon, upon Lottie, who's smiling affectionately at me, approvingly, endorsingly. And there isn't a single person, I believe, in this room, believer, unbeliever, seeker, questioner, whatever, who doesn't want the world to which Lottie is being grown up in, to which Jude is going to grow up in, to which the baby that's going to be born. We want that world to be a better place for those children, for our children and our children's children and our children's children, children's generation. And as a church, we have a part to play in bringing God's kingdom here on earth, in Durham, as it is in heaven, for the children and young people, for the present and future generations. The former Archbishop, Archbishop William Temple said, the church is the only cooperative society in the world that exists for the benefit of its non-members. And when the church doesn't get consumed in its own needs, because that's not what Jesus calls us to do, when the church serves, we follow a saviour of the world whose name is Jesus, who said, I came not to be served, but I came to serve. And that's the calling of every church. Our calling to bear witness to the love of God to all people. Our task is not to recruit people to the church. Although it is lovely to see people who don't normally come to church. I was like that for years. I'm a minister. I've been a minister for 40 years. And I still wonder what I do going into church. <laughs> but it is lovely to see you. And we hope that many of you will return. Because it's a good place. Because you'll always be welcome here. Our task for all of us within the church is to be ambassadors, ministers of Christ. Nigel, who doesn't really look like a minister in his shorts and t-shirt and plays the drums, <laughs> and Dave, who doesn't kind of look like a minister, but they are ministers, but they're not the only ministers here. Look around you, upstairs and downstairs, and every member of this church is a minister. They are ambassadors for Jesus Christ, seeking to share with those who come to church and those who are beyond the church that God loves them, God cares for them. Durham Baptist Church. For 10 years I've been reminding you that you're a missional people. It's through you that the love of God is made known, that the good news of Jesus brings light and life and hope and healing and can bring beauty out of brokenness, can bring peace where there's anxiety where people can know that they are truly loved and valued and safe and secure, that you don't actually have to get a tattoo to, to discover your identity, that you can actually be valued and secure by being embraced by the love of God. With God, there can be freedom from addictions and guilt and shame. Broken lives can be made whole. The comfort that can be given to the brokenhearted, to the grieving, Joy and laughter can flow and dispel the heavy and threatening clouds of pain, depression, and fear. With God, there is care and compassion. And when the good news of Jesus is known, when the kingdom of God is at hand, whatever life throws at us, there is nothing that will ever be able to separate us from God's love. That's good news, isn't it? Well, I realize this is normal for Norfolk, but in the north, we tend to get a bit of enthusiastic about good news, all right? <laughs> there is nothing, there's nothing that Lottie's going to face in her life will ever separate her from the love that God has for her. That is good news. And the same is true for you and me. And the signs of the kingdom, when the kingdom of God is at work, here on earth in Durham, is that people will not walk around. I walked through Durham on Friday, and with all due respect, there's a lot of people walking down at heel. And in Christ, they can learn to walk tall. They can walk with respect and dignity, knowing that they're loved, knowing they're affirmed. Where abuse will be no more, where disease of body, mind, and spirit will be a thing of the past, where there'll be no more racism or sexism, there be opportunity for all, where wealth and privilege are not the means of getting on in life, where justice will be realized for all, where the poor will feast, where the homeless will be housed, where the stranger will be welcomed, where the refugee will be befriended, where broken hearts may be whole, where there's no underclass, where those without hope find hope, and they find meaning and purpose, and they find it in Christ. I've come, said Jesus, you can have life. Not life limited, 
but life in all its fullness. That's the good news of the gospel. And it will be seen as the kingdom of God grows here in Deerham and changes people and society for good. Politicians are desperately throwing measures and, and lies and propaganda and papers and policies and strategies. We are in a mess. We are in an utter mess. We have abandoned so much of the foundations of our society that were rooted in the Christian story that was about love of God and love of neighbor and how to relate to the stranger and the homeless and the refugee and the poor and how to exercise justice and equality and freedom of opportunity and how to give life to all people, not for the, not for the few but for the many. We've abandoned those things. So it's time that the church rediscovered its voice, not as a kind of whinging, condemning thing and mournful thing, but a good news voice that says there's a different way to live. There's a kingdom of God that can come here on earth and it comes through the good news of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God can be made known among us. And the kingdom of God comes through ordinary people like you and me. Yeah, a few preachers turn up in churches and speak to the minority, but it comes through you and me, ordinary people, just getting about our ordinary lives and just sharing through our lives, sometimes through our lips, sometimes just the way we live, the good news of Jesus. That's how the kingdom grows. I quoted, when I was with you a few weeks ago now, Mother Teresa. I can do great th I can, I can do, I can do things you cannot. But you can do things I can't. Together we can do some great things. Isn't that a great opportunity? All of us. Or Desmond Tutu, who chaired the Truth and Reconciliation process. Do your little bit of good where you are, because it's those little bits of good that put together overwhelm the world. Church, it's good to be part of a movement that's bringing good news to society, isn't it? Yeah. There's so much selfishness and kind of like self-control and, well, no, looking after ourselves. It's good to be part of a church that kind of, I want to say to you, give away what you can, what's not yours to own anyway. Be the blessing that God wants you to be here in Tiram and as, Dearham. And as those things happen, you will see the come, kingdom of God come here on earth, in Dearham and Norfolk. And you know what? It'll be a better place for Lottie to grow up in. It'll be a better place for all of us to live in. I'm sure that gets all of our votes, doesn't it? Well, the party to vote for is Jesus and his kingdom because he brings the true revelation, the true manifesto, the true transformation. The kingdom of God is at hand. Let's rejoice and be glad in it. Amen.